Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette. What's going on, buddy? How are you? What's going on? I got bullied by Rosie to come on here. He said he's going to beat my wheels off again if I didn't come on. So I said, sure, boys. I think we had video teed up that that said the other, the, the lesser known scrap in, in Toronto there. I think you probably got the best of me, big boy. Nah, I don't know about that. Did you guys see the picture on the on the one that we had when you were with the Flyers? It looked like you were putting my eye drops in. I gouging you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do, baby. Hey, hey, that you didn't eye gouge me. It must have just been taken at the perfect time where you ended up getting me right there, and it just it looked like you were eye gouging me. Yeah, I think I'm trying to rip your baki off at uh, in front of the bench there, but I know I saw that too. Someone put eye drops <laughs> in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, all the all the memes start flying as soon as the internet takes over. Dude, I, I think it's so fucking hilarious. Like when you get like two former fighters together because like i wonder like conversations in like 20 years when there's like there's been no fights in hockey like former tough guys who have who have went after each other for years like what that conversation is going to be like well what's it like like seeing each other for i don't know you probably haven't seen each other very many times since the, those two scraps i think rosie you could speak for yourself but i'm just relieved that i don't have to do it for a living anymore because i would get anxiety before games knowing that i would end up having or in more, most cases having to go out there and scrap and so anytime i talk to a guy i, I fought before like we just had jay or um, nasty morasty on the podcast john nasty yeah. morasty and like we were joking around the fact that he used to he i mean he broke my nose probably two or three times We've had Yablonski on. So for me, it's more relief and we can have a good chuckle about the fact that we used to get paid to, to go after one another. Yeah, it's it's funny, man. Like uh, I had anxiety about talk in general and fighting too, but uh, meeting up with a guy that you did it with, it's just like, you know, he'd be your best buddy on the team and you know, you think alike. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not a big deal at all. But my buddy last night actually was sending me some fights for some reason of back in the day, there's like some clip of being with the flyers and he's like, what happened with you impressed you or something? And I went and looked at it and my heart just went, bah, 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 bah. and I was like, fuck dude, I can't look at this right now or I'll, I won't go to sleep. So to, it brings back memories of like a different life for sure. Oh yeah. Get the beats per minute up for sure. Yeah. As soon as you start watching them, you, you, you get all, all jacked up. Well, it's uh, it's great to have you on, man. Um, what's the last week been like for you? Like off the air, we we're talking about you're at a point where you need a publicist for all these interview requests, eh? Uh, I've been I've been swatting a few away, but I know I I owed you guys one, and of course, like I said, <laughs> having fought Rosie and and him getting involved in the media game, you got to snap it around. So it's uh, it it hasn't been fun. Like like doing something like that's not fun. I'm happy that the former player of Mike Babcock, a guy who, who's still in the league, reached out and, and explained what was going on. Uh, did I think that it was ever going to get the traction that it got off the original podcast? No. Um, people might say, people might think I'm being naive when I say that, but it was something that I'd mentioned to Wit when we were just talking about going into that next show, like, hey, you know, like what, what types of things you want to talk about? And I was like, hey, listen to this one. And he was like, what? So in the midst of the podcast, I completely forgot about it to mention it, and he teed me up. So it came off like we were almost like half joking because we were just you know being ourselves and, and talking the way we talk. But ultimately, if if that former player doesn't reach out to me and say, "Hey, you got to expose that this is going on," for the sake of the young guys who are probably having to deal with it, where even this guy being an older guy, like he went through exactly what we described. And his life was to be made a living a living hell while playing for Babcock. So I think that he was just like enough's enough. Like the fact that this guy hasn't learned, like the not only not only does he, you know, does he need to face punishment for this, but when he was playing in Toronto, they used to have a designated guy who would warn guys about this behavior. Like, think about that. You'd have to have a guy on the team to warn new players about the fact that this was gonna happen. And I know it was portrayed as something innocent. Uh, but that was not the case. This was a power dynamic. This was this guy using leverage. And in, and, in, in so, and in some cases, from what we described on the podcast, it was actually even worse what was going on in Columbus, which ended up coming to light with all the meetings. So you've been very open with your anxiety. One of the things I love about you in general, you're authentically yourself. Like you said it, you're from well in Ontario. And, and I love that aspect of you. Like, what was your first reaction? So you get this text and Obviously, you're like, holy shit. But like, I don't know about you. Like, I've been tipped off a couple of times in my career, like a major trade or something's happening. And then I put it out and I'm like, I feel that anxiety. Like, what was that situation like for you when you bring it up on the podcast and it starts to blow up a bit? 
Well, so I, as soon as we got done recording, I'm like, ah, I should probably reach out to a guy from the team and just double check. I know that, I know that this guy wouldn't be lying about this and the fact that he'd also talk to players on the team. But I, once I got confirmation, I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, it's, it's happening. So glad that these other guys are going to get the heads up and you know, whatever happens up from it happens from it. So, yeah, I mean, I was a little bit the next day as it, I, I opened up Twitter like <laughs> later in the afternoon and I understand that this thing had caught fire. Yeah, I, obviously you're just, you know, your heart's racing and you're like, oh, geez. And then when they come out with a statement denying it, you're like, OK, now I'm in one. And, you know, from there, from then on there, it was more of just we understood that we were telling the truth. The thing that helped me calm down about it was the fact that more stories were coming in after the, the whole initial uh, PA and, and uh, Columbus statement where, where Johnny and, and, uh, and Boone Jenner had basically said that they weren't uncomfortable with the interactions. Now, I don't want any of any negative light shun on, on Johnny and Boone because the type of situation they're in where what if, what if they do tell the truth and then there is no action taken and Babcock stays around? Rosie, I don't know. Did you ever play for Babs? No, I didn't, and and I get what those guys are just doing damage yeah. control for their team right there. But I mean, I, the important part to me, and I think you've said it, is like I hate cancel culture. I fucking hate it where a guy said something twelve years ago where that was half acceptable at the time. They dig that up, and there goes the guy's career. I can't stand that shit. But this wasn't that. This has got nothing to do with that. And I've had these coaches before where whether it's as intentional as Babs seem to be or not, they just going to the rink they hold it over your head they use their power in a way that's just like nothing else i've seen i've done other things in my life and there's nothing that i compare to these coaches that that fuck with you like that and it's it's unnecessary it's got nothing to do with a, a hard-nosed coach that demands perfection that demands you give everything you have nothing to do with that i'm all for that this guy is just a pure just a pure prick and i appreciate how you stuck to your guns because i got tons of memories of you know how much different those types of guys were than the good coaches i had and why those guys are still allowed to be in the game just blows my mind and you guys blew the lid off of it and and rightfully so there's no there's no reason for that bullshit it's got nothing to do with hockey and and all that stuff that he'd done in the past as, as bad as it is and, and the list goes on and on and on I said, I, I even said after the, everything had came to light, like I had no ill will towards this guy. I'm a second chance guy. If he went away and rehabilitated for four years and figured out the way that he was treating these players, we're making them feel that the way that these guys are expressing now, then then good for him. You know, like, like where are we as a society if you can't let a guy go rehabilitate and come back and get a second chance? I mean, within reason. I mean, we're not talking about like murder here, but yeah. it's, 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 it's it was bush league and then i'm sure you guys have heard the the worst of the worst is the fact that one of the situations was at his house in michigan and he was scrolling through the, the guy's uh pictures and his text messages it's like ridiculous. what does that have what does that have to do with hockey it does like i don't you don't you can't do that in a fucking steel mill if you work there like there's right. nowhere on the planet you can do that and it's just it's just these coaches just sometimes some of them the bad ones think it's they can do whatever the hell they want and you, you can't do that anywhere in the world especially now why would you be able to do this to these grown men who have you know worked their ass off to get to this level you, you can't treat them like uh you know an ant it just doesn't work that way they have they have their lives and they have they have their own self you know respect and they shouldn't have to put up with that bullshit and and I yeah and and I I keep trying to shed light on the fact that like this was this was a former player stepping up and and letting me know about it. This has nothing to do with the Chicklets podcast. This is a, a former uh, player of Badcock sticking up for these new guys in Columbus. This is the the players in Columbus coming together and and putting their foot down. And this is a great job by the PA to even though the first uh, allegations were shut down and they came out with that statement, they still ended up looking more into it, and then they ended up going to Columbus and then finally digging into this to understand that these younger players, if maybe if the PA doesn't show up, they, these guys don't have the balls to come forward and explain what is actually going on. And the, everyone's saying, well, like, oh, well, what's he going to use in the camera roll against these guys? Like, I don't understand the power dynamic uh, uh, argument where it's like, I'm telling you this former player who told me about this, when he got to Toronto, it was the same experience and he was, his life was to be made a living hell to the point where he had to ask for a trade to get out of the situation. 
That's not the way this sh stuff should be going down. This is not the way that these kids should be treated. We're not talking about accountability and, and getting bag skated because you, you played like a dog the night before. We're talking about me mental warfare here. Yeah, and for me, I mean, the even bigger story is Columbus. And we said this when Babs was hired. A, he was fucking ridiculous. He had to wait for his contract to wrap up before he can sign a deal. Like, yeah, get every penny, Mike. And then number two was like the fact that Columbus went through this process and this is the only guy they thought could do the job for them. Like there's so many, you know, and I think you had a nice piece on Pascal Vincent the other day, like poor guy. He steps in his first national league job behind the bench as a head coach. And here you are taking over for Mike Babcock. But I got to ask you, like, you got to thank you text from, from a guy like Patrick Liney yet or what? No, no, no. And like, <laughs> I, I, I would imagine that their PR team was like, stay away from that guy. Stay as far <laughs> away from that guy as possible. This isn't about, this isn't about me. This isn't about spitting chickles. This is about a team getting a, a coach who deserves to be in that position now coaching them to where they get to show up to the rink every day and enjoy the game that they fell in love with to begin with and not being discouraged by, by some of the, the mental warfare that might've been going on if, uh, if they would have had Babcock as a coach. Cause if it yeah. starts. If it's starting before training camp in year one that he's been re reinstated, Ridiculous. I can only imagine if he's getting away with that, where the, the, the power and, and, the, and all that starts to grow in his own head. So, and I hate to be shitting all over Babcock here, but I don't know. I just, I guess I wasn't very impressed with that statement on the way out either. There, there was no accountability. Dude, they thanked him. Yeah, How do they you thank, thank the guy. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, hey, I, if you got to cover your own ass, I understand, but there's one guy who the problem was, and he's out, and, and we can leave it at that. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be a redeeming quality about him, does there? But I want to I wanna rewind back a little bit, Biz. I mean, you talk about so much, and you're very self-deprecating is one of your shticks, it seems like. But I remember, you know, rewind back to 2010 or so. Um, you and me are both about the same vintage, cracking into the NHL. I'm with Toronto. You ended up, uh, you know, started with Pittsburgh and ended up in uh, Phoenix's organization. And I remember you were hitting the Twitter hard. And making some noise with it not pulling any punches not holding back saying what you thought and at the time like now but even more so the nhl was pretty conservative guys didn't put themselves out there all that much and i specifically remember guys saying that guy is tweeting himself right out of the league you're never going to hear from him again blah, blah blah and i didn't have twitter when i was in toronto i probably should have but i didn't want to put myself out there and I remember all the shit you'd say to your the trolls and whatnot and just, you know, boom, years go by and you look at what you got going on now. What was that whirlwind like for you and, and how it just took off? Well, so I was fortunate because when I when I um, I got picked up off by waivers, there was three teams that put in a claim. It was uh, Phoenix, Minnesota and Toronto. And you're in Toronto and you said, oh, I should have hopped on it then. But. I don't think that organization would have allowed a quarter of what I was doing on social media. And it sure. just so happens because I was in Phoenix, I don't think it like they just really didn't seem to care that much. Did I get called in at a certain point a few times to get pee pee whacked? Yeah. I mean, Don Maloney had to say, Hey man, come on. This is like, this is like ridiculous that you're doing this. But uh, I was just fortunate that I ended up in a market where it was okay for me to let it fly. And I was able to just be myself online and it, like you said, especially the NHL, as conservative as it is, they had never seen an athlete going online and, and just acting the way that I was acting. So I think that some people took a liking to it. It obviously gained traction because of how different it was. And I was able later on to get just more and more opportunities from it. Uh, like I remember one year I went to, to work for Sportsnet during the All-Star break. Now, I, actually, yeah. this is a crazy story. So I, went, I was going to do a bunch of content with them. And uh, at the time I was on Twitter, I had a Blackberry then. And yeah. when we were, we were going around all day and we were filming content, somehow it, it had gone into my, like my phone had opened up and because I, I don't think I even had a lock on it at that point, it yeah. went into my pictures. And you know, when you share funny pictures with the guys on the team, there was a happy new year and it was in li like cocaine lines and that girl oh, was snorting, snorting the, 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 the H on the happy new year. So nice. it just kept, tweeting this photo over and over and over. <laughs> so it must have tweeted this, this picture 25, 30 times out, out, out of my pocket. So finally, after like four or five hours of me filming this content, I pull out my phone and I see all these like replies to it. Like, oh, this guy's done. This is the final straw. Da, 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 da. I got a missed call from our PR guy with the Coyotes, Rich Nairn. And oh. 
I'm like, oh, we we obviously ended up. Everybody, there was a couple of replies that said, oh, he must have been hacked because it, it tweeted out 25 times. So yeah. I went with that right away. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> hacked. And for whatever reason, I couldn't delete them on my phone, so I had to like go to the sports book. Somebody let me in the back, and we went on logged on a computer and like ended up deleting everything. So there was definitely some crazy times in the early days of my Twitter antics, but. The line from back then as to what you could say online to where it is now has drastically changed. And I guess fortunately enough for me, I was able to walk that line. And, and as I said, it continued to open up more and more doors for me to where I, I became more comfortable on camera. And uh, I would say my heart rate after opening up my phone after that was probably more so if I was the last man back stick handling and I had uh, Datsu coming and forechecking on me. So <laughs> I believe it. Well, Biz, we got a we were a Leafs show, and uh, yeah, we had yeah. some things to talk about. But uh, big things happening in Leafland. I noticed last year more than ever, you kind of started to voice your uh, fandom for the Maple Leafs, and it's a good time to do so. What do you What are you thinking about this year with everything they've put together over the summer? I, I like it. I think that they did a good job of retooling. I think they were fortunate with the the cap situation where it is to get Tyler Batuzzi on on a one year deal at that price. Um, I'm very interested to see what happens with Nylander at center. I mean, he's a dynamic player as it is, but there also is a lot more responsibility defensively. So, well, hey, why not start it earlier in the, in, earlier in the season to see where it goes? Um, I like where their toughness is at. I still think that there's probably a little bit of a question mark on the back end as far as maybe where the depth is, but uh, and then maybe a little bit net, but... Uh, it sucks that Murray's Murray's injured again, but overall, I think that this is a team that's easily going to make playoffs. So it's just a matter of whether what they can do and and how they're gelling at the time where they do get there. But uh, getting Max Domi in the mix, I mean, he's a hometown kid, so you got to imagine that's adding a little bit more spunk to his game. And uh, yeah, so I just I just like where they are from a team toughness perspective, especially with adding Reeves as well. All the other guys can just worry about playing if they need him in the lineup. And if he ends up playing 50, 55 games, great. If he's in the lineup every night, even better. So they have that intimidation factor. But top to bottom, mm -hmm. I, th I think that they're pretty much right where they're at, they were at last year. They're, they're going to finish top three in that division and they're going to make playoffs. Yeah, I'd argue they're better too. Uh, speaking of Revo, like we, he played when we were playing and I mean, you can just, there's a plethora of guys that have been wiped out of that role and he's managed to stay in the league. And I always, you know, shake my head and say good on him for continuing to find, you know, uh, a way and find contracts and find teams. And he's walked that line so well with that role and being a great locker room guy. What do you see that's kept him in the league for so many years af after similar guys have been done and gone? I, I mean, he's still a guy who can play like that eight to, to nine minute range, right? Like I was a guy who was playing three, four minutes and you seem to get really lost in, in the shuffle. You get out there for your two shifts a period, you're cold. So I've just noticed throughout his career that the, the teams that he's on, the coaches trust him enough to throw him out there to where he's able to stay warm and and relevant. I think he brings a lot to the lineup. He he doesn't shy away from the physical stuff where he doesn't forget what his role is. No. So uh, you know, so I, I I think that overall, I think that he's a, a very a very solid fourth line player who can bring that eight minutes a night and add that intimidation, especially for the fact that there's no other guys in the league like him. What is there, five, six guys that could, could maybe scrap with him? Maybe. Uh, I, I, I would put Wi-Fi, Lucic, Delorier, uh, yeah. uh, McDermott. Like, who else yeah. would maybe fight him? So that's I, covering most of it. That, yeah, there you go, right? So I think that that's still a, a very important aspect of, of today's game. And when you got guys who are drawing as much attention as Matthews, Nylander, Marner, night in, night out, it's going to help where you, hey, you say, hey, go out there and remind those guys if they go near them a little bit closer what's going to happen. Yeah. And I it's think valuable. that that plays, plays – it's a very val – and you're only paying the guy a million and a half bucks, so it's perfect. Yeah. Boys, it's great that you're both scrappers because, like, my biggest question is, like, what's different from Revo, from Matt Martin or Wayne Simmons or anybody else who's been in that Maple Leafs lineup is? I think, like I said, I think that Mar Matt Martin's a guy, I bet you he's probably playing even more minutes because yeah. because Islanders rely heavily on that fourth line with Sezikis mm -hmm. and Clutterbuck. And, I mean, they've been together for, for how long now? I bet you they've played probably 300 games together at least. 
Um, so mm-hmm. is, is, as long as, as long as you could throw them out there from that eight to 10 minute range, they still add value where if you're, if you're only playing two, three minutes, that's where you're, you're now all of a sudden you're throwing your top three lines out there too much. And, and it's too much strain on the, on, on those top three. Yeah. And I think it's different because that's a different air with a different team. Like Matt Martin, I think would at the same time that he was there, if he was here now would be valuable. It's timing. This team's ready to rock. They're, they're top of the NHL. They, they have the potential to win a Stanley cup and you can see it from the lightning. They come in and they try to, they try to run you right out of the barn. You got Stamkos ragdolling stars. Like you can't let that shit happen. And if you have a weakness, a team's going to try to expose it. And at this point in time, when they're ready to go and make a run, you need, you need to fill that void or you, you'll be exposed. That's why I think now is a good time for him. Hey, Biz, you got some Jurgens lying around? Uh, wh- why you ask? Because I, I got a steamy one for you that I think you should bring up on the pod. A rumor? No, just in general. Steven Stamkos. We want to fire oh, that you up. Think c- c- coming home? Let's go, baby. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I think that he, for sure, he probably gets a deal like Kopitar where he yeah. ends up staying and these guys, well, I mean, d- difference because there's no state tax. If I'm, if I'm them, I try to get Stamkos locked in at about the $4 million range. But Hey, if, uh, if, if all of a sudden this thing drags out, I could see him itching to come back home and taking even more so of a hometown discount. Than he would be, would staying in Tampa Bay, so that would be a that that would be some much added leadership as well, because you know you got this core group of guys in Toronto who are still a little bit younger who haven't made it over that hump. I think adding guys like that alleviates a lot of that pressure. That's why I mean, having a guy like JT around is important. Mind you, yeah. he has not won a Stanley Cup, so I would imagine come playoff time he feels just as much of that pressure from that that as that other other members of the core group being as young as they are but the more the, the the older guys you can you can add in there to deflect much like ryan o'reilly did come playoff time like if, if if they don't trade for ryan o'reilly there's a few moments in that series against tampa bay which they didn't deserve to win where he stepped up and made a play where that's the whole reason they made it out of the first round i mean you go yeah, back man. to the face off he won you go back to the was he the one who scored the goal or was he the one who passed it to nylander in, in the one game it, yeah. but either way he made two massive plays in the first three games yeah. to help them bring bring them to victory For yeah sure. you just need you need more guys like that right rosie yeah i mean adding stammer to anybody is incredible why they didn't at least talk to him about it obviously cap concerns and whatnot in this day and age is a huge deal but i don't know <laughs> at this point in time even talking about stammer being added to the roster is just amazing but i mean you're looking at nylander stammer i mean little crossway thing going on it'd be pretty incredible i just i don't know if stammer is ready to leave the golf course and and hit exactly. the, the lights and the media hordeness that is toronto at times so uh only he knows but it's fun to throw it around you know it's a you know what's a leafs podcast when you're fucking stirring it up like this talking oh, Stamkos that's, coming that's, home that's already we haven't even started year. the fucking season yet pump the brakes yeah no, yes i do have my jerk hard we interviewed Frank Saravalli the other day, and we're already asking about extensions for like Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi. They haven't even played a game yet, <laughs> so we do. Yeah, well, that that cap's probably going to bump up five million, and depending on how the season goes, these guys are going to probably get their payday. I know it's been a hell of a week for you, but uh, good on you for everything you've done, and we appreciate you coming on, man. We'll wrap her up for you. Hey, thank you guys so much. We'll do it again soon, and uh, go Leafs, go! Got a boy. Woo, woo. <laughs>